And it's a huge pleasure to introduce uh, our fabulous panel, Alex Hay from iView, uh, ABC iView. <laughs> Louisa Bartolo from QUT. <laughs> and Kylie Papalato from QUT. So before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we're meeting on today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. So this panel's about the current state of automated content curation in video and the public interest issues that this raises. Video streaming platforms have been important crucibles for the development and mainstreaming of automation in digital media. For many of us, video platforms are where we come into visible contact, visible and immediate contact with automation every day in the form of algorithmic recommendations in our home screens and feeds. Over the last few years, we've had a lot of discussions within ADMS and elsewhere about the social effects of this automation. Much of this discussion has focused on recommendation in particular. So we can think here of the debate about Netflix filter bubbles, about political polarization on YouTube and many other examples. So in this panel, we wanted to continue this discussion, but we also wanted to place it in a slightly different context and to think about content curation as something that involves always a mix of human and algorithmic curation, hardware level and platform level curation, as well as a mix of content types that often require very different kinds of regulatory treatment and standards, including news, entertainment and advertising. All of this means that the actual extent and dynamics of automation in video are quite uneven and necessarily vary a lot from one service to another. So in today's panel, we're going to be asking where in the video ecology is automation happening and where is it not happening and what might be the reasons for that? So to discuss these issues, we're very, very lucky to have here three expert speakers and myself um, with amazing experience in the worlds of digital media. So Alex Hay is Senior Product Manager for Partnerships and Distribution on ABC iView. Alex is a TV and media professional with over 15 years experience in broadcast and streaming TV, product management, partner relations and entertainment metadata. And we'll be speaking about iView's position on automation in the context of public service media objectives. Louisa Bartolo is a PhD researcher at QUT who studies governance of and by algorithmic recommendation on commercial digital platforms. Louisa's research focuses in particular on processes of recommendation around contentious historical debates and on historically underrepresented content crea creators' demands for improved visibility. And Louisa will be speaking to us about Twitch and automated content curation in UGC platforms. Kali Papalado is a senior lecturer in the law school at QUT and an ARC DECRA fellow. Kylie's project examines the impact of copyright law in Australia's screen industries, focusing on distribution and access to audiovisual material. And Kylie will be speaking to us today about cultural and legal factors in automated content curation. And uh, as I said before, I'm Ramon Labardo from RMIT, and I'll be presenting some new research that we've been doing in, at RMIT about smart TV interface design and what it means for users and policymakers in Australia. So that's the plan for today. Thank you all for coming. Uh, with no further ado, we're going to hand it over to Alex. Um, so we'll all speak for about you know, five to seven minutes. Uh, and please, as we speak, um, pop your questions into Slido, and we'll get to as many of them as we can after the talks. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Ramon. Thanks, everyone, for having me. It's really lovely to be here. And thanks for the um, ABC crew who's down the front here supporting. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about today today about some of the um, current experience that the ABC IV product team is going through with regard to automation and it's actually a really key moment for us because we're right at the point where the human curation and the automation or personalization is coming into play. Uh, so I just got a couple of, I guess, top line points to talk about. Um, at the moment, our audience already assumes that everything's personalized just by way of what they're seeing in their other devices and in their screen experience. So there is just some assumption there that it's personalised by default, which is something that we're talking about quite a lot within digital products at the ABC. Um, login to watch. So we recently, like in the last year or so, introduced login to watch on ABC iView. Um, and we had a, a variety of kind of responses to doing that, but essentially login to watch is really the only way we can deliver a automated or personalised experience and meet that audience expectation where they are. And as well to compete with some of the other streaming services, of which there are now many in the market. 
the IVU team has a really experienced uh, editorial and curation crew. Like we have um, an editorial team who specialise in news, the general entertainment, indigenous, kids, regional and local. So they watch all the content, they know the content intimately and part of the skill of that curation is, is you know, how they blend that now as an editorial team in iview. But there are challenges with doing that when we're trying to cover such a breadth of content, everything from news through to, through to kids' content. Um, so I think that they do an amazing job, but I think even they are kind of starting to realise that in order to meet what the audience expect from a streaming service, that this human curation alone is really not going to be able to do what we need it to do. Um, here's a stat. We all love some data. 67% of the ABC IV audience come once a month or less and make up only 7% of the plays. So we call that a casual audience. And they're a casual audience for a number of reasons. Um, some, sometimes it's to do with perception. We're seen as a really serious news-driven service and so that might not be what they want to watch. Um, there's also, as I said, so many streaming services that go direct to consumer now. There's also issues around prominence and placement off-platform and discovery of our content amongst a lot of paid services. So there's, they're all the challenges that we're facing in terms of uh, that casual audience. But we know that if we have more automa automation and personalisation um, in within iview when they do come in that 67 percent of the time we've got more of a chance of holding on to them and making the experience sticky and delivering for them more of what they're actually after whether they're a news viewer who never watches kids but keeps seeing bluey when they come in or if they're more of a light entertainment watcher who keeps seeing four corners and gets turned off because of news fatigue they're the sorts of challenges that we know are happening um, and that's what we're trying to alleviate and, and the path for us to do that is around automation and personalization. And I would just say just on that, um, the middle point around the curation, we do know that um, on, the, on the iView homepage at the moment, I would say probably 10% of the page is personalized. Right now we do have an internal um, content discovery and personalization and Rex team. Uh, and we're starting to experiment more and more, but very, very small amount of what you see on the homepage is personalised, but those rails do convert at the moment better than some of the human curated rails. So things like, terms like trending and um, popular right now are always appealing, um, but also recommended for you because you watched. Those sorts of terms do tend to draw people in and they do convert through and you know speak directly to the audience. Oh, and the last point there, off-platform discovery. Yeah, especially with the connected TV market, it's becoming really important for us. And it, again, just talking to the casual audience behaviours that we did some research on about a year ago, there's all different reasons why, um, you know, the partner we, that we're dealing with in terms of the partners that we work with. So we work really closely with Samsung and LG, Google, Apple, Foxtel, Fetch, so there's a whole range of different local uh, connected TV platforms. Um, the, the smart TVs are our biggest share of the audience, but the Android TV audience is rapidly gaining on it uh, with Google TV. And we've seen sort of changes in how even Apple curate their home screens um, because of they now have Apple TV Plus, so they're making content. So that's a real change in a partner behaviour where they used to come after us to just to put more content on, on their home page. Now they've kind of relegated us to more of a kind of um, iview space while they're primarily promoting their own content so that's a real shift in a partner that used to deliver us real you know conversions and and, and views and minutes viewed um, so there's lot there's lots of different examples of that I could you know tell you a thousand stories about <laughs> the conversations we've had with partners over the last three years but that off-platform connected TV space while it is challenging at times does also present opportunities for us as a product team um, to really meet the audience where we know they are uh, so the blend of content automation and curation is something we're starting to look at inside of our own apps and um, this um, view here is a view that came out of some design-led work um, actually from the ABC Listen team who were starting to look at how to blend um, personalisation from an with an automation um, lens with the content curation um, and we sort of came up with um, these sorts of key areas. So we're always gonna have editorial priorities that we want the audience to know about, whether they be moments of national importance or programs that we've spent a lot of time and, and money investing in. Things that we know are always gonna be popular that people will come to the ABC for. And then things that we call hidden gems and experiments. So the space where we can play around with the, with the editorial team to try and pull things out that we think might 
um, you know, break through and sort of speak to the audience um, because we do have that, you know, wide breadth of content. And then on the automation side, when we're starting to look at how we, you know, create recipes and feed that automation engine, safe bets, so things that we know this particular user is going to like, they like a lot of comedy content, other comedy shows are probably a safe bet, likely discoveries, things we think they might find anyway or come across um, in relation to what they've been watching, and then bubble busters, how do we try and break them out a little bit of that um, recommendation or personalization bubble that they might be in. So if they're a heavy news watcher, is there content they can cross the bridge and bring them over into some of the other news themed or, or light factual kind of shows? Uh, so um, this is some of the structure that we're starting to look at within the product teams with our content teams of how we might uh, approach these sort of challenges. A personalized homepage to reflect viewing habits. So at the moment, when you go into iView, pretty much everyone sees the same thing. Um, there's a couple of spaces, as I said, that are personalised, a couple of rails. The top part, this is where real estate and UI is hugely important. The top part of a streaming homepage is like the gold dust location. That's where people spend most of their time. Usually underneath that is a continue watching rail, also extremely important, a watch list rail. Sometimes there's live viewing rails and then you start to get into because you watched recommended for you. Um, the intention for us in the like in the next or the second half of this year is to personalize the iview homepage as much as we possibly can so really to go from 10 percent of the homepage is personalized to 90 percent of the homepage is personalized um, the key um, kpi and we do have kpis as a public broadcaster that we're trying to meet is retention as a product team so we're trying to retain that audience and convert that 67 percent monthly into fortnightly and weekly users so that when they come in there's, there's more of what we think that they want uh, and as a product team you know there's a two-way street the off-platform challenges are one thing but we need to be able to deliver against audience expectations when they come into the product uh, and that's kind of where the space where we are at the moment as a, as a product team so prominence, promotion and distribution on connected TVs has rapidly evolved in the last four years. A COVID obviously accelerated it with just more people in streaming apps watching TV. Um, probably 2020 was when we saw some of the smart TV manufacturers really uh, start to move on capitalising the fact that they had a screen in everybody's house that they could monetise vacuum up first party data from and just make look a lot more sexy than it used to look and so Samsung and LG and Hisense TVs just look a lot more like Apple TV used to with really like rich content offerings. Unfortunately things like preloading of iView or other free to wear apps went away as part of that. We are now asked to pay or enter into commercial agreements for prominence and that's something that is just not possible. Our content's already been paid for by the Australian public. We, we don't believe we should have to pay again. It, the content should be there uh, by default as a public broadcaster. And these are some of the challenges as well that have been um, um, have been going on overseas in the UK. Um, but th these are some of the topics that are coming up, certainly for us um, in within the ABC and also some of the other free-to-air broadcasters as well. Um, around 76% of program players on iView are now via our TV apps, which is huge. We, we have seen an erosion of like viewing on web uh, and mobile is a lot of the mobile content is kids content um, the connected tv or tv apps are huge the audience on android tv has more than doubled in the past three years with the google tv product which is both a product you can buy very affordable from jb hi-fi and google have also um, set themselves up um, as an oem so they're running google tv as like middleware on tvs uh, and it looks really good, it's really easy to use, it's really easy to search for content on there. We are preloaded with Google at the moment. Uh, I feel like there's a clock ticking on that. They are starting to bring more advertising into their home screen, um, but for the time being, we have pretty good universal search and, and we're working with them to do integrations where we can. Um, yeah, catalogue feeds for universal search is really important for us. It doesn't solve everything, but it does mean that if you search for Bluey, you'll land on hopefully an iView page, not a YouTube clip, um, which is something that we have seen on some of the other products. Uh, and then um, I guess just the last point I'd make, editorial and curation will likely focus more on metadata as we're kind of reaching that point of blending the automation <coughs> and the curation. Metadata is really, really important. Um, it's like gold dust when you start to get into content discovery in Rex. There is a lot of mystery about how um, content recommendations happen off platform. 
Um, but also there's mystery of how content recommendations happen inside platforms. So we, we have internal teams and <coughs> some of the challenges at the moment are around you know, what happens when you build a recipe and you run the results and everybody's got a slightly different opinion about what should actually be recommending against the content. Take that inside a public broadcaster and it's, you know, add a few more um, opinions in there as well. So there's some of the th there's some of the challenges that we're, we're coming up against as an internal team. Um, and I think the content team, like I said, realise that we do need to make automation key um, but it is you know it is challenging when you've got content makers who are you know trying to get their content to appear in places and have always had guaranteed positioning on home pages and that's going to start to erode and, and go away um, also the abc is a huge the source of a huge amount of content from all genres and generating quality metadata at the source seems like it should be easy but actually it can be really hard sometimes the people that generate the content or entertainment metadata are the most junior people at the in the channel or, or in the team and um, so there's there's ways of resolving that around um, style guides and governance but also machine learning and, and AI can help with that as well particularly for news content that's really fast moving and they're things that we're hoping to explore and then I guess the last thing I'd say for us as a, a product team is data analysis and experimentation is really shaping up um, as the way for product and content teams to innovate and drive automation and that's a space that we're trying to work on um, at the moment is how we kind of can experiment more with that blend of editorial and content and, st and starting to address things like, you know, better metadata, what happens when our content goes off platform, you know, what what is our content recommending or how is it discoverable um, and how can we address that and then once we're bringing the audiences in, how can we retain them and make that experience <coughs> much more sticky. Um, so there's, I guess, some of the topics that as a product team working um, at literally at the coalface of editorial teams and product teams trying to implement automation and the challenges that come up. Um, they're just some, I guess, talking points to, to kickstart the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Am I going bar? Oh, good. <laughs> With the weed. So yes, hi, I'm Louisa, and I'm going to be talking about my PhD project today where I'm trying to answer this big question of what does socially responsible recommendation look like? And I'm looking at that on entertainment and cultural platforms. So a really important first point is that in my case, I'm looking at you, the recommendation of user-generated content. This is important to highlight because it means that the content that is getting recommended in my case studies hasn't gone through gatekeeping in the same way that the content on ABC or, or Netflix and we're going to hear has. And so there's been lots of concerns raised about algorithmic recommendation of user-generated content. A few of them are concerns about opacity. We don't understand how our information ecosystem is being shaped by these technologies. There's concerns around inappropriate content and the, the idea of platforms having a special responsibility around harmful content that they actively promote as opposed to merely host. Um, concerns to do with user privacy, we know these systems rely on extensive um, profiling of users. Concerns around user autonomy, there's this idea that we're being nudged, we're being pushed to see content, even that we don't even realize how much we're being pushed to see content, so ideas that we need to sort of put power back into users to choose their diet. Um, Fairness for end users, so there's been some really interesting research, although it's quite hard to know to what extent there's kind of discriminatory targeting through algorithmic recommendation. And then finally, the two points I focus on most in my research is concerns around fairness for creators. So are people being gi given visibility in a way that we consider to be fair? And then the broader social externalities of recommendations. So here you can put concerns around filter bubbles, radicalization, the idea that what people are being suggested has broader kind of social repercussions. And although I focus on those last two, the reason I sort of listed all those concerns is because I think we can all agree that trying to deal with one issue means we have to inevitably consider all the other challenges and it's like a constantly making trade-offs between these different challenges we're addressing. So in my PhD, I'm looking at the live streaming platform Twitch. Uh, for those of you who aren't so familiar with Twitch, it's a live streaming platform. It focuses mainly on gaming and esports, although it's rapidly branching out to cover a lot of different types of content. 
It was set up in 2011 and acquired by Amazon in 2014. Now, it's considered a top live streaming platform globally, especially for user-generated content. It has more than 2 million regular streamers and approximately 15 million daily users. So in 2022, they were talking about Twitch as being too big to fail. It got a real boost during COVID as well when people moved inside and relied on these platforms more. Um, one way, and it's not the only way, but it's becoming an increasingly important way in which people find streamers to view on Twitch is through the Twitch homepage. And so this is a heavily personalized homepage. Basically everything except the top banner on the homepage is personalized algorithmic recommendations by Twitch. And in my uh, PhD, I start at a very specific point. Um, in 2020, the head of user experience at Twitch put out a statement, was interviewed, which he said that in, over the last two years, so between 2018 and 2020, and 2020, Twitch had invested heavily in its algorithmic recommendation systems. Historically, it had just kind of ranked uh, streamers by popularity, but more and more it was investing in algorithmic recommendation. He boasted that in, these two, in two years, um, they saw a 700% increase year on year in the proportion of content that people reached through their algorithmic recommendation systems. And he made the claim that as a result of algorithmic recommendation, the system had become more equitable. So whereas previously popular streamers kind of kept getting uh, more and more visibility, now algorithmic recommendation was allowing them to kind of distribute that visibility more widely. And so he uses this word equitable to mainly mean smaller channels are getting more visibility than they previously would have. But what's interesting is that there is a much broader discussion around equity, which I will get to um, in a second. But before I do that, I want to highlight a couple of key things. These platforms are hyper-competitive spaces. So the odds of success, although we hear of a few cases, as everyone here knows, the odds of success are super low. Uh, for creators in, on most platforms, but especially on Twitch, uh, visibility means both kind of expressive you know, potential, but also financial uh, opportunities. Uh, visibility on Twitch is very, very tied to monetization. The, to give you a sense of just how competitive these systems are, in my study period of four months, less than 1% of all the streamers who are live ever made it to the homepage recommendation. So we're talking about a tiny sliver of There is a long-standing, there's long-standing concerns in the gaming community, but this has also carried over to Twitch, of real marginalization of streamers. So communities who already face marginalization of Twitch being further marginalized on the platform, facing harassment, um, being very, very underrepresented amongst the top earning streamers in ways that aren't very transparent. And there's been, this has been, there's been lots of research about this um, over the years, how gaming is a space that can often be hostile to people outside of the male, able-bodied, white um, streamer. There was a specific campaign launched a year before, uh, in 2019, sorry, um, which where transgender streamers in particular were pushing for Twitch to introduce identity tags. So on Twitch, a streamer can voluntarily apply tags to their content and this content describes this these tags describe the content so for example it might say competitive or funny or something like that so for a long time twitch didn't have any identity tags apart from an lgbtqia plus tag which seemed to be a bit more of an ad hoc thing that they had there in response to pressure but not a very well thought through uh, strategy the transgender streamer community argued that to be more discoverable they needed a tag to be able to tag their content as transgender, which would allow people who wanted to find transgender streamers to search for them. Twitch resisted for two years and eventually accepted and apologized, saying they should have done it sooner. They introduced over 300 new tags, very detailed identity tags, which so now you could get a sense of not only sort of what the content was about, but who the streamers were from an identity perspective. So based on this, I try to answer two questions. The first is to understand to what extent streamers that self-identify as transgender were getting visibility on the Twitch homepage. And second was a kind of more conceptual question, 
of what would good representation for transgender streamers look like? So the first empirical question, I was quite surprised with the findings. I found that, so over my time period of four months, 0.5% of all the live channels use the transgender tag in their streams. And this matched the proportion of what I found on the homepage. So from one perspective, Twitch was doing quite well, you could argue, or at least kind of making transgender streamers visible uh, at the same proportion of, of their sort of existence on the platform at that time. So it was kind of roughly proportional. But this taps into a wider debate, which maybe we'll have time to get to, it's my last point, um, on what, it would, what fairness means. So there's a kind of argument that for, for, in group, for groups that have been historically marginalized and underrepresented, what we need is more than proportional representation to kind of counteract that historical exclusion. So there are ideas of algorithmic reparation. To what extent should we try to use algorithmic systems to try to counteract some of the historic uh, imbalance and invisibility and boost streamers, historically marginalized streamers to a greater sort of extent than we would do for, for other streamers to counteract the disadvantage and that me. Hi everyone. I think we're in an appropriate room for a discussion about AI. It seems to have a mind of its own. <laughs> Um, before I begin, I'd also like to acknowledge the Gadigal people and um, that I'm a guest on their land. Um, I'm going to keep my comments pretty brief today so we have some more time for discussion. But um, as Ramon mentioned, I'm from law, so I want to focus on some of the considerations with recommendation and uh, TV streaming that I think are relevant to law and policy. Um, in particular, my area is copyright law, and I really think about copyright as the sort of underlying condition that structures this whole ecosystem, because it is the law that underpins the industry agreements and arrangements around what content is available and where and when and for how long and to whom. So uh, the first point I want to cover is that the TV streaming market is enormously fragmented compared to other areas of media distribution. Australia has now upwards of 20 streaming services that cover, you know, free, ad-supported, subscription-based streaming services, and content is fragmented across these services with a really high degree of exclusivity meaning that a lot of content is only available on one platform and not multiple platforms. And what this means for viewers is the need to have access to more platforms, uh, generally at, with cumulative costs. So this figure on the slide is from a paper that uh, Ramon and our colleagues, Alexis Scalata at RMIT and Nick Suzor at QUT, uh, recently submitted, which looks at the access and affordability issues for vid video streaming in Australia. And what we found was that the market segmentation and copyright restrictions create an environment where Australians who are struggling most with cost of living pressures uh, are effectively shut out from accessing a lot of cultural capital and therefore participating in cultural conversations. So this um, figure sort of shows that as well as infrastructure costs, people need internet to, to pay internet access for streaming and then on top of that there are the costs relating to access to the platforms which for most of the subscription streamers is about $15 a month. So the cost can, can get up there pretty quickly when you have to subscribe to multiple services. So what we did for our study was we looked at award-winning Australian and US film and TV from the last decade. So we built a list of titles 
based on the main categories of the major industry awards, including the Oscars, the Emmys, the Logies and the Actor Awards from the last decade. Um, so we built that list of titles and then we looked at where those titles were available for Australian audiences and how much that would cost for people to access. And what this table shows is that the vast majority of content we looked at is only available for those who can afford to pay. So the, the orange with the big numbers are, is content that is only available on paid services. So we can tease some of this out more in the discussion afterwards, but I think it raises some important considerations around um, cultural policy, who is culture for, who can afford to access it, and also the importance of um, public service broadcasters like our friends at the ABC. Um, the other point I want to quickly cover is, um, or that I want to touch on, is representation diversity, which I define as the varied ways that humans are represented in storytelling across the full and overlapping spectrum of gender and sexual orientation, race, nationality and language groups, abilities and disabilities, and bodies. In general, the uh, film and TV industry seems to be getting better at representation, but this is really um, dependent on their own initiatives. It's not at all regulated, even through sort of soft regulation. And in fact, representation or representation diversity is not something that law and policy has traditionally cared much about. Um, when media regulation has sought to promote diversity, this has manifested mostly as restrictions over media ownership to avoid a concentration of power. So it's an idea of diversity that really focuses on a diversity of ownership and a diverse diversity of control over media organisations. But representation diversity is important and I think there are many reasons why we as a society should be trying to promote it. Complex, accurate and varied representations of all members of society, especially marginalised groups, can foster for positive relations between people from different backgrounds, reduce harmful stereotypes about minority groups and build up individuals' sense of themselves and their place in society. Representative stories are also vehicles for messages that can shape opinions and political actions. Um, so, you know, we're about to see and are already starting to see a whole lot of debate, for example, in Australia around the voice to parliament and uh, um, how Indigenous people have been represented in the media will be important to, to shaping how people feel about that. Um, people learn through stories, including the stories that they see on TV. So in that sense, um, diversity, I think, is a social good. Diversity can be promoted or measured in a number of ways. I like the... Sorry, that didn't work. Here we go. I like the framework um, from Philip Napoli, which looks at three types of diversity, source diversity, content diversity, and exposure diversity. Uh, in the sense of film and TV, source diversity is, is about generally who's behind the camera, who is writing the stories, who is directing, etc. Content diversity is, is what we see in the stories that we watch. So the characters and also the actors. Um, and exposure diversity is about whether audiences are actually exposed to, to this content that is more diverse. Exposure diversity is where ADM becomes relevant. It's where recommendation plays a part in determining what content people are exposed to and, and what they discover. And I think that representation diversity as a value is one that we should pay attention to in the operation of recommender systems. Particularly from a cultural studies perspective, it's important to consider what it means to optimise for user preferences and personalisation when those preferences have been shaped by a culture where unequal representation is endemic. 
the tendency of recommendation systems to display popularity bias, that, as Louisa sort of talked about, um, can, is particularly concerning where that repeatedly amplifies films that offer narrow representations of the world or where it prevents lesser known films or, or TV programs that might do better on representation metrics from breaking through. So um, I'll kind of finish up there. What, I, what I've tried to do is, is to provide a sort of brief glimpse of where my interests in law and policy and regulation intersect with a consideration of automated content creation and video services. What's available to whom and at what cost is very much determined by copyright law and licensing arrangements. And then that in turn can impact on what is recommended to audiences. Um, because for example, where platforms have paid really high licensing fees to get access to content, they, they have an interest in, in getting that in front of viewers. Um, and, and that can be in tension with perhaps recommending more diverse content. So I'll finish there. Okay, and finally, um, I wanted to share some research that we've been doing uh, at RMIT. And so by we, uh, that, that means me and Alexis Scarlatta, who, uh, as Carly mentioned, um, uh, has collaborated with us on many projects and uh, has been uh, done incredible work on this project. So big props to Alexa, who's online today. Um, so this project's about content discoverability in smart TVs. Uh, and we've been doing a few different kind of methods um, as you can see from that image, we have a little lab at RMIT which is full of um, a sample of uh, current model smart TVs from major, from all the major manufacturers. So, uh, so that's been a great resource to play around with. We look very closely at the interface design on those TVs, um, how the recommendations work, how the search works, what services uh, and content are promoted are visible and what the services and content are not visible. Um, so that's one of the things that we've been doing. And we've also um, done a user smart TV user survey at the end of last year, which was a nationally representative panel survey, uh, where we asked people a whole lot of very detailed questions about how they use their TVs, uh, how they use their remote controls, how they discover content, search behavior, um, and also some kind of opinion questions on uh, content diversity on their smart TVs, um, uh, questions about prominence in public service broadcasters and a whole bunch of um, other issues as well too. Um, so from the perspective of that research, what does, to us, what does automated content curation look like as an, as an issue and as a phenomenon? And I guess the first thing I'd mention is something that um, Alex and Kylie have already raised and that is that the video ecology is extraordinarily fragmented and complicated and that automation is happening in different parts of that ecology in different ways and at different speeds and for different purposes. And really the main, the thing that explains that best is the, the business models of different sites which um, mean that automation um, is, uh, you know, either desirable or essential for, for as a curation mechanism. So um, at one extreme you have social platforms, uh, social video platforms, YouTube, TikTok and so forth which have extraordinarily large contents, of, uh, catalog, um, extraordinarily large catalogs in the millions of titles uh, and need automation uh, and personalization to make that content navigable. In the middle, we have SVODs, which have smaller uh, sub subscription video on demand services, which have smaller catalogs. So we're talking, you know, kind of 2,000 to 7,000 titles per catalog. Um, and which are kind of, um, which m mix human curation and uh, algorithmic curation. Uh, and then at the other extreme, we have the broadcast platforms, the broadcast to video on demand platforms, iView, SBS on demand, 7 plus, 9 now, 10 play, which have, again, smaller catalogs again, so in the hundreds of titles, uh, and which are generally less personalized. Um, as in the case of iView, we have one row. Um, it's probably similar for most of the other BVODs, um, although that's changing very rapidly, and we'll see what things look like in the future. But I guess that's been the structure, I guess, the structure of the kind of video ecology in terms of automation um, to date. Um, but the second kind of complicating factor, which is something that Alex um, uh, spoke to before, which is that devices are also curators now too. So we have device level curation, most obvious in smart TVs, 
Uh, so um, any TV that you buy now uh, will have its own inbuilt operating system and platform which will um, selectively curate, uh, filter, recommend content based on commercial agreements between the, the manufacturer, the platform operator and, uh, and video services. So it's essentially a pay for play kind of environment as, as Alex mentioned, which raises a huge number of very interesting issues about, um, about I guess the um, gatekeeping role of devices and of a device, the TV, which has historically been a kind of neutral device which didn't differentiate between content. So this is something fascinating uh, to us and something that we're looking into closely. Um, so what does this look like in practice? This is um, just one image from a recent report that we did about uh, local content prominence in smart TVs. Um, and here you can see the app launcher rows for Samsung, LG, Sony, and Hisense TVs. Um, and so, you know, I guess the takeaway here is that, you know, depending on what TV you buy, you're gonna have a different mix of content content services promoted to you. Um, visibility and the prime positions on the left-hand side are subject to commercial negotiation. Um, but as you can see, there's, there's a kind of interesting policy issue here in the sense that um, all the rows have Netflix, YouTube, uh, Disney Plus, um, I think that's it. Um, but then if you look, if you played kind of find the local service, it's, um, you know, it's uh, much more difficult. So there's a couple that have KO, uh, one or two that have Stan. iView makes an appearance on Hisense, which is great to see. Um, but but really, obviously, the um, the overwhelming kind of visibility is for is for US based services. So this is essentially what we're talking about in terms of the prominence debate at the moment, where um, local broadcasters are uh, very actively seeking through regulatory reform guaranteed positions on the home screen um, in order to compete on on a kind of equal footing with um, with the big SVODs and AVODs. Um, so uh, I'll just mention one other piece of research that we've done recently too. So this came out of the user survey that we did a few months ago where we asked people about um, their smart TV use. And uh, included in that survey, we did a little visual test which, um, which showed a current Samsung um, smart TV home screen. Uh, which had a hero banner for an Amazon show called The Boys. Uh, and like most hero banner placements on smart TVs, that's a paid ad, but it's not labelled as such. Um, and so we asked people, why do you think that TV has recommended that show to you? Uh, and the results were very interesting, although not entirely unsurprising. Um, uh, less than half of people could correctly guess or state that that was a paid advertisement. Um, they said, you know, it's because the TV thinks you might like the, that show or it's been randomly selected and so forth. Um, but yes, less than half could kind of answer the question correctly. So that's not, again, it's not surprising, but it does show that um, the boundaries between advertising and editorial content in current TV interface design are very, very leaky. Uh, and, you know, this is, again, I think part of the Wild West environment of smart TVs at the moment and smart devices more generally where the kind of standards and separation between ads and editorial uh, is not, you know, it hasn't evolved to in the way that we expect of other media, of older media. So, um, just finally, um, this is a very interesting space to watch. In the coming months, we're going to um, most likely have um, the announcement of some kind of pro prominence policy from government about uh, a must carry regime for local broadcasters or possibly some other must discover regime. Um, there's also kind of parallel discussions around some of these issues through the ACCC digital uh, platform services inquiry as well too. Um, so, you know, by the time we have the symposium next year, I think we could potentially be in quite a different place in terms of uh, regulation, um, including, you know, um, possibly uh, some of these, uh, the prominence um, reforms in particular might have policies on um, recommendation as well too. Um, I'm going to leave it there, um, but thank you so much to, to all our presenters and I'm going to now address some of the um, very large list of questions that you've put into Slido, so thank you so much for all the questions. Okay, so let's start 
with you, Alex. There's a couple of questions for you. Firstly, there's some compliments on how you powered through the automated interruptions with the blinds, so we appreciate that. <laughs> um, but uh, a great question here. How do you think about serendipity alongside personalization for content on iView? Oh, that's a really good question because I personally love um, the serendipity approach. Um, so I think my understanding of what that question means is the kind of the zeitgeist or how does um, how do the the human factor kind of cut through uh, at like a fully automated or personalised uh, homepage and I think that's where um, an editorial team can really shine. I, just thinking of a couple of examples, neither of them are iView related but um, on Binge they have uh, on a show page there's like three keywords that describe the show or genres the third one's always like a really funny or weird one that usually reflects like something that's going on like on social platforms often people will screenshot those and share them on twitter or threads or whatever um, and i think those are the sorts of things that people love that shows that there's someone there that there's other people that the people who are putting together this content know it and love it and are part of the, the the conversation and the other example i would think of is SBS On Demand during the World Cup, uh, they had a rail on the home screen of content that they called stuff to watch between games. And that's also something that just kind of cuts through and people go, yeah, that, you know, th again, there's somebody home. So I think that's the serendipity side of it is really important to, to um, I guess, feel that there is that human element and it's not just machines. Um, but yeah, the, the surprise factor or the, you know, the, the hidden gems um, in terms of how we approach that as a product team, an editorial team for iView and our other digital products, we're still kind of working through that mm -hmm. ourselves. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Louisa, if viewers donate money and time to stream as they subjectively like, how should we balance supporting marginalised groups against viewer autonomy? I think this is a really, it's a really hard question. And that's why when I put that, I put that list at the beginning and one of the questions was around the, the consensus around user autonomy, right? Like there's always a trade off. Um, I think what I would say is that platforms already take a lot into consideration beyond user autonomy. So the idea that the choices they're making are between user autonomy and uh, doing things for societal good is, is I think a bit of a, limited uh, framing of things. Um, also bearing in mind that a lot of the research shows that our interests are very much shaped by what we're seeing anyway. So uh, this kind of feedback loop that goes on between something having a prominent place, us clicking on it, the system learning that we like it, giving us more of it. Um, so I think I just, I kind of want to complicate a bit that idea of user interest. I don't think it means that there aren't challenges, so I'm not trying to say there aren't, but I think there's a lot more space uh, for platforms to curate for with different ends than is sometimes made out. Mm. Fantastic. Kylie, how do you understand the relationship between source diversity, content diversity and exposure diversity, uh, perhaps with reference to Indigenous run production companies? Yeah, sure. That's a really great question. I think there's often a presumption made that if we improve things at the source, that necessarily improves content diversity. I'm not entirely convinced by that. I think we need to have concerted effort at all stages, um, in part because um, the people at the source are operating within systems that, that might be pushing against them in, in terms of what content should be made available, right? So um, I was reading an interesting article just the other day about how um, director, female directors like Greta Gerwig um, and um, Phoebe Waller's-Bridge, who are known for making really um, unique sort of female-centered content are now playing a greater part in established IP, you know, Indiana Jones, Mattel type stuff. And there's nothing wrong with that. But it, it's they're, they're still operating in the constraints of a society that's trying to, to push them into things that, that kind of already exist because that's easy IP, that's easy money for the, um, you know, big commercial entities. So I think there needs to be diversity at the source stage, but also we need to be committed to allowing those stories to be told 
at the content stage mm. and then committed to ensuring that those stories are discoverable at the exposure stage. Um, yeah. Mm. Do you think we need another... Well, I'm going to maybe make it a thought because we have to finish now, but the, it, just in like Nathalie's framework, mm. um, the, the question of kind of discoverability diversity or um, uh, visit, you know, in terms of recommendations and visibility of content, not necessarily exposure um, consumption, but um, seems to be a missing element perhaps that uh, needs to, that we can kind of revisit today or we'll have to take this up. Yes, I shouldn't have. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we'll leave it there. But thank you. Um, this has been a can fabulous Can I ask panel. you a super quick question? Uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it have to be 30 yeah. seconds. <laughs> 30 seconds, I promise. Um, you mentioned about the, the paid placement of prominence of television. Is part of the, the regulatory reforms, um, I, is some of that looking at the sort of disclosure that things are paid advertising in the same way that we see on social yes. media? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's been floated as one of the uh, as one of the regulatory options. Okay. So yeah, yeah. Great. Well, we'll have to leave it. Please come and grab us though and chat more. Um, we'd love to hear what your thoughts on all this are. Thank you so much, and apologies that we didn't get to all the questions. But um, and thank you, huge thanks to Alex, Louisa, and Kylie.